is going to be weird. Recording is on. Turn on the video. Show my ugly face. Oh, it's going to be weird too, isn't it? There we go. Okay, video screen sharing. Cool. What part of why would people enter a waiting room that's not activated? Silly old machine. Just, I do it every day. Like. It's all been mutated. Um, welcome to uh, CE3372, a lesson 17. So what we're dealing with today, just so that you know ahead of time, um, interesting technical challenges. So there's, that's the computer I usually record on, and it's, it's all messed up. Um, and some of these recordings are taking 22 hours and so forth to upload. So I kind of have uh, network issues. And I guess that's life. So my usual complaining about network issues, I take them all back. Because they were nothing compared to what's going on right now. So we'll do the best we can. Um, I guess my message to you from this point forward until I have everything functioning correctly again. Although it's going to get worse because next Saturday Texas Tech is going to enforce two-factor authentication. So that's going to break everything. Um, pay attention because there's no guarantee that the uh, recordings will, will survive. Alright, so now that I've uh, scared that out of you, um, let's go on with today's lesson. I have I think I've graded the exams and the uh, Blackboard should be showing you the grades. And I've uh, graded quite a few of the exercises, so we're kind of caught up. There's two new exercises that are available. And while I have your attention, I'll attempt to check the due dates. The computer's running really slow. It's, it's uploading to YouTube right now, so um, slowness is not a surprise. Uh, so there's exercise set six and seven. They are both... Due on the 28th. They're both due next Wednesday. Um, not, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Uh, one of them is actually quite easy. I don't think you'll find it difficult at all. And the other one is also supposed to be um, easy, although it does involve some interpretation of elevation information. Um, so Let's go take a look at exercise six. So this is a classic stuff you would have had in um, a hydraulics class. So you're asked to apply <clears throat> to several different geometries and ask some questions on that. So uh, that should be quite straightforward. Back, oh. And exercise seven 
is um, as follows. Let me get some. Oh, it's not going to behave, is it? We'll do it that way. <clears throat> Exercise seven. Uh, your first one is you have um, this figure here. And we're told it's 250 acres rectangular. So from that, you can get uh, distances if, if you need to. And you have some dots that represent represent different land surface elevations and then you want to create a contour map draw flow paths uh, <clears throat> draw the longest flow path uh, from the highest elevation to the outlet so the highest elevation on the rectangular portion is this 150 and um, the flow path might go straight down that way or it might have some curve to it and that's what you learn from your contour map um, once you have a flow path drawn, determine its length in feet. Uh, determine the average slope along that path. Apply the NRCS upland method. Um, then using NOAA Atlas 14 Volume 10, estimate the rainfall intensity for a three-hour storm. And then uh, use some runoff coefficient table. Apply the runoff coefficient for the subcatchment. Estimate the peak discharge. Once you've done that, uh, go ahead and attempt to use the SCS or the um, Texas Hyedo method to produce a 10-year, 3-hour storm at 15-minute intervals. So straightforward drainage hydrology. Go ahead, get out of the way. <clears throat> And let's move on to the actual lesson for today. Uh, home page. Wait for it. Wait some more. And maybe it'll get here. So today is storm sewer conduit sizing. And We'll take the link to the content server. Um, so we're going to look at conduit size selection. So these are initial estimates using rational method storm sewer design. There's some important readings. Uh, one is uh, storm drain design. So this is from the land development handbook that uh, we have other readings from. And um, uh, this would be a good reading and this is just a repeat of a suggested reading from last time. In uh, WURBS on page 622, there is uh, some discussion on urban stormwater management. And we should recognize that picture. That's the one I used. And you can see um, only a hassle here is it's scanned backwards. So you'd have to keep track of page numbers. And then in uh, Chin's book on page 479, there is a description on uh, stormwater uh, calculations. So this example here is a real simple one to show how to size pipes. You notice that has our famous picture again. And Today's lesson is largely going to follow uh, this uh, rational method storm sewer design from um, May's book. So it starts here. It's called rational method design, and it goes through some requirements relevant to that. And we're going to use the we're going to use this example the Goodwin Street um, example uh, as the motivating example. And it's, it's, it's done in this um, textbook copy. I will fill in a lot of the missing terms because producing this spreadsheet from just reading the textbook is not as straightforward as one would think. 
Lastly, there's uh, some notes here um, of a fabricated example to illustrate how to use um, these methods of rational design to make an initial drainage system layout. So here there's an inlet, another inlet, another inlet, and we're going to uh, size these two pipes. The pipe connecting manhole one to manhole two, manhole two to manhole three, and this document goes through the entire um, process to do that. So those readings are available to you um, to help uh, clarify what's going on. In the video link section, um, these don't exist yet. I'm hoping they actually succeed at videos. In data links, there should be nothing in supplemental data. Yeah, that's empty. In spreadsheets and scripts, there's the storm Goodwin Storm Sewer spreadsheet. We'll probably visit that today uh, briefly. And then a couple of portions that were downloaded from the NOAA Atlas 14 server. So let's go with lesson notes. You'll notice there's no PowerPoint. You'll notice there is no portable document format uh, because we're already at nine megabytes, and once this thing gets rendered, uh, it gets big fast. So I hope I have a local copy, but if you want to look at it, you can click on it and it should download. Oh, I'm going to regret what I'm about to do. We'll go ahead and attempt to open it directly, and let's see what happens. Nothing. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, he's 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 a funny cat. Um, and we have my finished spinning beach ball because my poor little laptop right now it's uploading a video to YouTube. It's capturing this video and now it's trying to download a nine megabyte file on an already overwhelmed. Uh, network connection. So my home network connection, I'm supposed to get I'm supposed to get a megabyte a second upload. And I've been running really at somewhere around 50k. So almost um 150th of the contracted speed. And so I call I call my service providers AT&T and uh, they acknowledge that, yeah, my contract is supposed to be something and they can't deliver it. But for $80 a month more, they can still not deliver it. I'm sort of angry at them. Uh, and this one I can't blame on uh, Texas Tech. Normally I do that because that's an easy cop-out. But this is my network that's not working good. And you all experience that in your lives too. I know that. So I'm going to try to shrink this. Okay, that's about as out of the way as I can get. <clears throat> All right, so the title is Storm Sewer Conduit Design Using the Rational Equation Method. Um, so prior to me uh, going through this, I want to refresh the last time we talked about inlet sizing. So the design here assumes the inlets will be able to accept whatever flow gets to them. So whether... Whether we size the conduits first, then the inlets, or the inlets first, then the conduits, is somewhat irrelevant. Ultimately, we have to do both for our preliminary design. Oh, that's right. This is PowerPoint. Come on. Uh, it's one of those days. Nothing is working correctly. So the purposes of the conduits. Uh, they are to convey, convey flow from one place to another. And so those are pipes, culverts, open channels. Nico, why don't you just sit down? Everybody in the class loves you, but you do need to get out of my way. A little bit more, maybe? Right there. Perfect. There, you should have achieved the ultimate in catness. You're in the way, but I can still do my work. Oh no, you got to sleep on the laptop? No, it ain't happening. Uh, 
Um, convey flow from one location to another. And uh, conduits are things like pipes, culverts, and even open channels. And today we're focusing on pipes as used in stormwater systems. So those are going to be pipes that, that don't necessarily fill up completely. And our, our goal is going to be to select the size, the diameter, the material, what it's made out of, and the slope that we have to place the pipes on to uh, produce appropriate flow rates. So the typical storm sewer pipe materials are reinforced concrete pipe and uh, various plastics, uh, HDPE, um, spun PVC, and maybe ABS, although ABS is pretty expensive. Um, we don't use steel or ductile iron in storm water very often, and they used to use uh, vitrified clay. Um, that's a good material, uh, but it, it, it's hard to place correctly without breaking it, so it's kind of um, new, new installs are becoming fewer and fewer for clay pipes. Uh, by far, concrete is the most common material. For a sanitary sewer, uh, kind of the same um, statements, although they tend more to the plastic pipes. And the size that we need to select is dictated in large part by how much liquid we have to convey, but also by the burial depth relative to the drop that's available. And what I mean by drop is visualize, if you will, a place where the land surface elevation at one end of the system is perhaps 100 feet above sea level and we're trying to discharge storm water into a nearby stream and the stream elevation is at 80 feet above sea level. So on the surface that's 20 feet of drop but once we start burying pipes we lose some of that uh, elevation change um, unless we're willing to pump water which normally is not um, not not the best approach in stormwater systems. We try to avoid pumping. So what's nice is that we can obtain a good initial design using a combination of the rational method and Manning's equation. And generally that will get us our sizes and our slopes set correctly. And then we would check it using a hydraulic model. For example, SWIM, which is what we do in this class. Uh, the key thing about the initial design is we normally do it without much regard to the downstream boundary conditions. So we'll simply assume that the downstream elevation is whatever is convenient for us, and we later check any backwater effect with a hydraulic model. Okay, next one. So perhaps you recall this figure from a few lessons ago, or um, you've studied for the FE exam and you've seen it. So the, the, the approach to preliminary design is fairly straightforward. We're going to use hydrology to determine the required discharge in each pipe. Then we're going to use Manning's equation to, to size that pipe. And Manning's equation rearranged for diameter is shown here in the, uh, in the little white box. 1.333 Q times Manning's N divided by slope to the 1 half power quantity raised to the 3 8 power. And essentially what Manning's equation uh, does in that case is we're assuming the pipe is full. So it assumes that the depth to diameter ratio is 1. This, this top line up here where the cursor is moving back and forth. But if you recall, when we did our hydraulic element chart, that that same flow rate can also be compared, carried at roughly 80% fill depth. So what's really cool is some smart person a long time ago developed this methodology, and we're automatically building in a little bit of excess capacity without knowing it because our pipe system is likely to operate at 80% full. There's no good reason for it to go higher, um, and that gives us a little bit of extra uh, working freeboard. So 
what will happen when we do this preliminary design is if all goes well, things will flow at um, somewhere around 80% full. Then we need to specify a layout for the system. And in that layout, we'll identify drainage areas and, and inlets um, that are going to take water from that drainage area and put it into our pipe system. We also need to identify the outfall. And what's vitally important is going to be the elevations of both the land surface and elevations of the uh, bottoms of the pipes at different locations. Those elevations are called invert elevations. Um, <clears throat> elevation on the bottom of the pipe is an invert. Elevation on the top is called a soffit elevation. So there's a whole jargon that's been invented so that uh, hydraulic engineers can confuse everybody else they come into practice with and ensure that billing goes uncontested. Uh, that's, that's not the real reason, but <clears throat> it makes a fun uh, comment. For each of the drainage areas and inlets, we'll determine an inlet time of concentration using a methodology from our hydrology review. My personal preference is the NRCS upland method. That's the one that has the chart with slopes and land covers. I like it because it's, it's, it's really quite easy to use. Um, I find Kirby Kirpich, which I'm a co-author of, and um, the other ones uh, more tedious than necessary. But again, it depends on uh, local jurisdiction and what data you have in mind. Uh, some way of estimating time of concentration. And frankly, if the inlets are close enough together and the areas are small enough, you probably can get by with just using a 10 minute for everything. Um, so we would determine inlet time of concentration and we would use, we would also determine the drainage area and the drainage area runoff coefficient. So in the figure on the screen, <clears throat> there's an inlet uh, down here uh, labeled 1.1, and its elevation is somewhere in the vicinity of 732.3 feet. And this green um, area represents the drainage area that gets to that inlet. And so for that green area, we would determine what its area is in acres. We would determine what its cover type is in order to get a runoff coefficient. So let's say we get a runoff coefficient of 0.92. And um, we would uh, establish a travel time. Uh, it looks like this corner is probably the farthest physical distance uh, um, <clears throat> to that inlet in order to look up a time of concentration. And then we would repeat that for each of the other areas. So um, maybe there's 13 areas here. Uh, we might have 13 different inlet times. And we'll see how we uh, use that in a second. <clears throat> and then starting from the upstream most, um, we have all my graphics are screwed up. We would select a, a pipe size based on any design guidelines. So generally, we'll have minimum pipe sizes. Um, then we'd use our discharge criteria. So this equation here is that diameter equals 1.33 Qn over the square root of slope raised to the 3 8 power. And we would have velocity criteria from a local jurisdiction. Velocity is 1.49 over n. Diameter divided by 4 raised to the 2 thirds power times the square root of slope. So we would um, adjust our diameter to mess with velocity, and we could adjust slope to mess with velocity. And so we're trying to hit a velocity criteria and a discharge criteria. And then once we have a diameter and a flow rate, we can get a pipe travel time. And I'll, we'll go to that in a second. So we calculate an inlet time to this inlet. And then when we're doing the continued hydrology, we would include whatever flow is going in this pipe um, divided by that pipe distance to get a travel time in the pipe because we're going to apply a hydrologic equation at location 2, 1. 
and then at 3-1 and moving on towards the outfall. So at the most upstream inlet, we would compute the peak discharge from the rational equation, QP equals CIA, and that's determined from the inlet time. The, the intensity I comes from the inlet time. And then the pipe that's, that's attached to this end that's working to the rest of the system, we would size the pipe based on, on that QP. So this green area is going to produce a runoff. That runoff is QP, and it's going to go into this gray pipe. And that pipe is going to be sized to accommodate that value of QP. Then we would determine the pipe travel time, and we'll add that to the inlet time when we move to the next node downstream, in this case to node 2-1. So our most upstream node takes the green area plus the gray pipe. So in the, in the next node is this rose area, uh, 1.2, which is also a relatively upstream node. There's nothing upstream of it. And it has its own inlet time and its own QP, and that's used to size this little dinky pipe right here. Then the inlet time for area 1.2 plus this pipe travel time is uh, kept track of, and the Inlet time to area 1-1 plus the type pipe travel time to area 2-1 is kept track of. And area 2-1 has its own immediately connected drainage area. So when we get to point 2-1, we're going to have three times. We're going to have an inlet time for area 2-1, an inlet time plus pipe travel time for area 1-1 plus its pipe, an inlet time plus pipe travel time for area 1-2 plus its pipe. We choose the largest of those three times to compute the next time of concentration uh, to determine the flow that's going to leave junction 2-1 make its way further downstream. So here we include um, area 2-1 which is shown in yellow. And so we compute the QP leaving junction 2-1 as the um, area 1-2 plus area 1-1 plus area 2-1 according to its appropriate um, travel time, the, the larger of either the inlet time to 2-1 or the combined times from the other two. And that produces a peak discharge for this new combined area, which is the yellow plus the rose plus the green, and that's going to leave 2-1 uh, and be used to size the pipe between 2.1 and 3.1. So we size the next pipe from that uh, peak discharge. And then we continue downstream in the same fashion until we ultimately reach this outlet up here. Um, it's usually convenient to keep track of something called the CA value, which is the runoff coefficient multiplied by the area, and then the time of concentration as we move downstream. And uh, at the end we do checks to be sure that all the areas add up to the total areas. So the CA value should add up to the total area. And the time of concentration should be increasing in value as we move downstream. And if that's not the case, uh, you made a computation error somewhere. And it's easy to work your way back and find it and then fix it. When we get to the outlet, what we should have at that point is we should have pipe sizes and pipe discharges for the whole system. And then we would use that to check the hydraulics. We also actually have pipe slopes, too. Um, we could use SWIM and we would enter the uh, individual inlet flows directly to check pipe hydraulics. Um, and then we can use SWIM with the hydrology portion, portion and approximates the rational method to check a design hiatograph. And then we can use any SWIM results to adjust uh, design values and produce a hydraulic grade line drawing. So part of what we use SWIM for after we do the initial rational design is to be sure that the hydraulic grade line is where we want it to be. And um, 
uh, one of those places where we want it to be is underground if it's in a storm sewer system. Uh, but we might find locations where we want to adjust the invert elevations. And the swim tool lets us do that um, a lot easier than um, doing it by hand. So let's go through this design process in kind of slow, gory detail. And with any luck, we'll get through it today. Uh, if not, we'll pick it up again next time because it's a natural segue into the next um, lesson. So what I'm going through is based on rational method storm sewer design in um, the 2008 edition of Water Resources Engineering by Larry Mays. And um, it's on pages 613 to 635 of that book. And we have the excerpt um, on our class server. So you don't have to have the book. You've got the relevant portion. And the method that's being employed is the rational equation design method to make the initial design and its intent is to provide us with a workable initial design that we can apply subsequent hydraulic analysis. So what the workable initial design does not consider is it does not consider what the outfall water pool elevation is. So in this picture here if this creek if the water elevation of the creek goes up a lot um, that would actually send flow going the wrong direction into our drainage system. So the rational method cannot account for that. But what it does account for is getting everything out. And then that's used to make an initial usable design. So in doing such an analysis, uh, we have some preparation steps. First, we want to identify the individual drainage areas. Then we're going to determine the area of each contributing um, drainage area in acres because we're using the rational method. So some of the tools we can use are engage, the planimeter, G3 data. Um, if you still have a functioning Acrobat Pro, you can use the measuring tools in that. Uh, if you're good with AutoCAD or um, inroads, um, you can use the measuring tools in those software. I suppose you could do it in ArcGIS, but I think that would be kind of overkill. So measuring areas of pictures is, is, is not difficult. You've actually done that in other lessons, exercises in this class. And then we'd also would want to determine the rational runoff coefficient for each area. And that's a, a table lookup, uh, in this, and we would probably want to copy the table in any uh, documentation we build to be able to uh, defend our particular choice of rational runoff coefficient. So in the uh, yellow picture to the right, uh, this is the study area we're going to examine. So there's a uh, location here called uh, location 1-1, which is at the corner of Goodwin, I think it's Goodwin Avenue, although it looks like we're calling it Goodwin Street, in the corner of Goodwin in Oregon, and um, at the corner of California and Goodwin is another um, junction called 2-1. Moving up, there's junction 3-1, 4-1, 5-1, 6-1, 7-1, and 8-1 is the outfall uh, called Boneyard Creek. Within that, that main line, we have um, laterals attaching to it. So there's this one lateral from 1-2 two to 2-1. Two Another lateral from 2-2 two, two to 3-1, three, 3-2 one, three, to 4-1, four, 4-2 one, four, to 5-1, five, 5-2 one, five, to 6-1, 5-3 to 6-1, one, 3-3 three, three to 4-1, and, and so on. Uh, so those are the lateral connections. And then each of these uh, little junctions, for example, 1-2, has a localized drainage area associated with it. And... Um, so we would want to identify each of those areas, their physical area in acres, and their runoff coefficient, and possibly um, and slopes and uh, inlet travel times. Then once we have all that assembled, uh, we would go through and um, analyze each area. So for example, drainage area 1-1, we identify the area, drainage area 1-2, 
We identify the area. So what's going to go is a series of pictures. You're going to see blobs moving around. Drainage area 2-1. Drainage area 2-2. Two, two. Drainage area 3-1. Drainage area 3-2. Three, <coughs> Drainage area 3-3. Three, three. 4-1, 4-2, and that's it for the contributing areas. So now we've identified our drainage areas. And, and by identification means we have their boundaries on some sort of um, figure that we can make measurements. And so our next step would be to make measure the areas using appropriate tools. And so I'll go through a series of pictures just like the last one. Um, these ones are using Acrobat Pro, but there are other tools that are available and there's probably tools uh, that if you have access to them, uh, you can actually make the measurements in actual units. So with Acrobat Pro, one thing we can do is we can use the linear scale and we can determine in the software um, the area of a 400 foot by 400 foot uh, rectangle. So uh, that uh, orange area shown in the figure represents 3.67 acres. And what Acrobat Pro would report to us would report the square inches of that um, drawing based on whatever uh, sizing of the scanned image that we use. So Acrobat Pro is not specifically the best tool for engineering, but it's, it's usable. Um, we could do the same with uh, G3 data in a spreadsheet, although that's a little bit more work in my opinion. Um, there's software called Engage that when it works can do it directly in problem units and various other uh, softwares. So we measure a known area, we save the conversion factor. So that 3.67 acres equals a certain number of square inches in Acrobat Pro. Then we measure um, individual areas. So in this case, the conversion for the example was um, 2.43 square inches is equal to 3.67 acres. We save that uh, factor. Then we go to the individual areas. So Area number one corresponding to location one one um, came up to be um, <clears throat> one point five square inches. So we divide that by two point forty three. We multiply the result by three point six seven for an area of two point two six acres, and that's illustrated here in this um, measured area. Then we move on to the next one. We measure that area. Uh, perform the indicated arithmetic, 1.26 acres. Move to the next one. Measure that area. Uh, 3.89 acres. Move to the next area, 2.2. Um, measure its area in Acrobat Pro. Perform the necessary conversion uh, for 0.53 acres. And you know, in terms of being economical with time, um, the probably preferred way to do it would be to just keep track of the uh, square inches and uh, do those final computations in a spreadsheet. Area 3-1 is 0.68 acres. Area 3-2, 0.45 acres. Area 3-3, 1.58 acres. Area 4-1, 2.01 acres. Area 4-2, 0.66 acres. Area 5-1, 1.17 acres. Area 5-2, 0.66 acres. Area 5-3, 1.75 acres. Oh, I just realized, yeah, we went to Area 51, didn't we? Area 6-1, 0.54 acres. And then Area 7-1, that's a weird-shaped one, 2.17 acres. And that's our total uh, drainage uh, system. 
Then we would estimate the individual runoff coefficient. So we'd usually look it up in a table, something like depicted here. So this particular table is taken from the Chapter 7, Appendix F of the Oregon Hydraulics Manual. There's nothing particularly special about the Oregon Manual, um, although they provide a flat, rolling, and hilly classification scheme, which is unusual compared to other ones. And um, we could pick values out of this that are appropriate for those particular drainage areas whose acreages we just measured. And so now going back through the process, um, Again, using that table, I uh, will assign the various runoff coefficients. So for area 1.1, uh, the runoff coefficient of 0.65 is assigned. Now the runoff coefficients I'm using in this example are taken from the example in uh, Dr. May's book. So I'm, I, I'm not privy to the original source of the runoff coefficients. Um, but if we had our own example, we would have that table and could make our engineering assessment of an appropriate value for runoff coefficient. So this first one is 0.65. Area 1-2 is 0.80. So again, that's an interpretation based on knowledge that's not provided in the actual example. Uh, area 2-1 is 0.7. Area 2-2 is 0.8. Area 3-1 is 0.7, area 3-2, 0.85, area 3-3, 0.65, so a lot of garden there. Um, area 4-1, 0.75, area 4-2, 0.85, area 5-1, 0.70, area 5-2, 0.65, area 53.55, area 61.75, area 71.70. So those are now our individual runoff coefficients for each of those sub areas. Now while we're here we want to identify and measure conduit lengths. And again using our measuring tool in the case of Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, we can get inches on the drawing, and as long as we have a scale, we have 1.51 inches of distance is equal to 400 feet. And so we save that scale factor, and then we start measuring our conduit lengths. So for example, pipe 1-1 is going to connect inlet 1-1 to junction inlet 2-1. And um, one of the critiques of the example problem in the book is uh, the naming convention is admittedly a little confusing. So we take uh, inlet 1121 is pipe 11, and it's 415 feet right, using the measuring tool. And we do that for all the pipes, and we gather the information into a spreadsheet. So here's what we have so far. So we got the drainage area IDs, 1, We have the individual drainage areas. They add up to 19.61 acres. Uh, the prudent engineer would then measure the entire study area and hope that they get 19.61 acres. Uh, if that's the case, then you got all the sub areas accounted for. Then we have the runoff coefficient for each of the drainage areas, 0.65, 0 0.80, 0 0.70, 0 0.80, 70, and so on. And we have the inlet IDs. This is where the naming convention gets kind of screwy in this example. Um, so the inlet ID naming convention makes sense to me. The pipe ID makes absolutely no sense. So the pipe ID Pipe 1.1, 1 1.2, 2, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, 1, and so on. Uh, I, we kept track of the, um, the nodes. So pipe 1.1 1 .1 connects junction 1.1 1 .1 to 2.1. Pipe 1.2 connects junction 1.2 to 2.1. 1. 
Pipe 2.2 connects junction 2.2 to 3.1. Pipe 2.1 connects junction 2.1 to 3.1, and so on. And we have the individual pipe lengths um, on these uh, pipe IDs. And it's coincident that the pipe count is exactly equal to the drainage area count. Uh, that's not always going to be the case. So once we have everything in, into the spreadsheet, um, we can start determining inlet travel times. Um, so what I would do is I would make a best guess at a flow path, um, the longest uh, is, the, is the one we're looking for, and literally just a best guess at the longest. Um, there's a little bit too much inaccuracy to get all um, cluttered up in the detail of flow paths unless you think the lawyers are going to show up and sue everybody. So arguably, there's that flow path, or it could come entirely down Oregon Street. This one might actually be a little bit longer. It's going to have a very uh, small contribution in time difference. So I have this notation that says, use the method that makes the most sense, either to you or to your client or to the jury that you're going to have to defend your work in front of. We'll need to know some kind of cover, <clears throat> and um, we need to find the slope. And so from that flow path that's drawn there, pointed out by the green arrow, we're going from 735, 737 feet to 732 over a 243.7 foot distance is a slope of about 2.1 percent which is kind of low. We determine some kind of cover and then we can apply NRCS velocity, upland, <coughs> Kirby Kirpich, um, or any other method that makes sense. So using the upland method as an example, um, and then I tend to just uh, select, arbitrarily selected that particular uh, line instead of the paved line. So measure the actual best guess flow path. So in that case, it was 243.7 feet, has a slope of 2.1%. So I put the... <clears throat> 2.1% slope here, and it returns a velocity of 0.36 feet per second. And when we enter the path length, we can compute the time in seconds, the time in minutes, which is what we'll use. So we have about 11 minute inlet time. And then we repeat that for each drainage area to continue to populate our spreadsheet. And so here's the result of that. So these are the different inlet times done by the method uh, just uh, <coughs> described uh, to populate our spreadsheet. Now we need to specify the node elevations. And that's where we're going to use our topographic map. Uh, these are used ultimately to estimate or control pipe slopes. So in this particular drawing, we can see a topographic line here at 735 feet, topographic line here at 730 feet, 725, 720, and um, <clears throat> 715 is essentially the uh, Boneyard Creek. So let's see if we can find an easy one that kind of falls on the topographic line. So um, node 5.1 is a little bit higher than 720 feet and lower than 725, so maybe 721 feet. And so we use that kind of interpolation between contour lines to find the surface elevation of these nodes. And that's recorded, and then we can do offsets to put everything underground. 
So using those node elevations, we can estimate the pipe slopes. And so in the case here, we're using surface topography to estimate uh, initial slopes. So we have the pipe lengths and we have the slopes dimensionless that those pipes lay on and continue populating our spreadsheet. And then we will um, need to determine intensity information for applying the rational method. This is an interesting case because it turns out to be to our advantage to build a an IDF <clears throat> function for the study area and then just enter that directly into our spreadsheet. Um, so this particular example is in Urbana, Illinois and we can use NOAA Atlas 14 and for the example we'll use a two-year annual recurrence interval so we'll get the two-year chart off the precipitation frequency data server result and we either can choose annual maximum or partial duration series up here in the pull down menu and we download the table um, it's shown here and we'll analyze that in a second we'll use this second column and um, from the 5 minute to 24 hour should be sufficient and um, we put that table and use a solver to produce uh, an equation uh, intensity equals B divided by time of concentration plus an offset raised to the exponent E and we'll go look at the actual spreadsheet in a second and we'll use this equation for estimating intensity and runoff. So we can code that directly into our spreadsheet and uh, for each drainage area directly compute the required intensity. So for this particular example, the intensity function is uh, 54.82 divided by time of concentration plus 9.21 minutes raised to the 0 0.844 power. And here's the graphical representation of the curve. So for a time of concentration of um, 100 minutes, uh, we expect a rainfall intensity of 1 inch per hour. Um, for a shorter time of concentration, say 10 minutes, uh, we expect a rainfall intensity of 1, 2, 3, a bit shy of four inches per hour. So they won't exactly agree with the tabular results because we we passed a function through the uh, a table, but it gives us the ability to interpolate between lines uh, quite nicely. And then starting with the most upstream node, we'll apply the intensity equation and the rational method to calculate the discharge to the inlet. So let's go ahead and look at those um, spreadsheets. Let me grab the intensity equation one. So I chose AMS, which is annual maximum series. And it's kind of sad there's going to come a time when these spreadsheets won't work anymore. So here's the table that was downloaded from the precipitation frequency data server. So it, it tells us where we got it and um, the precipitation frequency estimate. And those those don't look like intensities. Those actually maybe those are intensities. Let me see what's yeah, it's intensity. It's telling us right there. And that blue part of the table is copied over onto this page in minutes and inches per hour. And then we take the logarithm of time, the logarithm of intensity, and here is the uh, an equation, which is based on E, B, and D. So this is the equation uh, that we're going to use to try to fit these tabular values. And by changing this value, let me copy all these 
So I'm going to change it so you can see what happens to the curve, and then I can restore them if I need them. Um, so let's say we have no clue, and we guess 111. And uh, that's a pretty awful fit. We can't even actually see it. Still can't see it. Oh, I don't even think it's plotting. Nothing to see here because we're not plotting it. So log time. Oh, it's been a while since I've done this. I think I want to plot. Ah, okay. I'm going to cheat. Let me go to the other spreadsheet to show you how the uh, fitting works. This one I think has, yeah, this, okay, so this has the plots. Because I don't want to try to uh, get the overlay in while you're watching. So the the blue line is our model equation. We can see that if we change this to a one, the blue line will move. The red, the red markers are from NOAA Atlas 14. So if we're terrible guessers, there's our first guess, one, 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 and that's a, a terrible estimate. And so we might be tempted to um, increase that and say, okay, good, that slides that up. So now I kind of have the two lines on top of each other, but it looks like I need to introduce some curvature. Not much useful curvature there, so. So they're, they're, those are kind of parallel, and it would uh, take a fair amount of trial and error to get these to lie on top of each other. Alternatively, we can use the solver add-in. So if I go to solver, and I want to, hopefully it's already set up. So I want to minimize this value, which is the uh, uh, sum of squared error. So it's taking this number, and it's subtracting this number and squaring the result and then it's going to uh, add them up for the sum of squared errors and so by changing values uh, g1 through g3 these values uh, we're going to try to um, make this number as small as possible the uh, perfect would be a zero I won't get there and we're going to constrain it so that uh, g3 the uh, offset has to be bigger than or equal to zero. We, we want to prevent negative numbers in the D variable. So we'll go ahead and hit solve. And I think I have it set up. It should show it plot each time. So there's our first guess and it is done. Oh, it's being stubborn. It really wants to crash. So we essentially have had it the, by the first time, but we'll let, let it finish its thing. So this is very much like the algorithm that actually um, does the pipeline networks. It's a it's a it's a form of a uh, of Newton's algorithm. So that Newton dude was actually pretty useful. And so there we are. So now we have this equation uh, based on these three values. And so, for example, for any time of concentration, let's say we have 12 minutes, we get a particular intensity, 33. We get a different intensity, 37, different intensity. And so all we have to do is enter that equation 
into our design spreadsheet. And we also have to include the E, B, and D values. So here's our designer spreadsheet. And we'll go to the top. So the pictures here, the E, B, and D values that we just fitted. Uh, we have the drainage area IDs. So you saw pictorially how those were obtained. Um, the individual drainage areas associated with them. The runoff coefficient associated with each area. The inlet ID. The inlet time. Pipe ID. Connectivity diagram. Pipe length. Pipe slope. And you notice at this point we haven't directly dealt with elevations. We use them to get the pipe slopes, but they don't appear on this part of the spreadsheet. And so now we will start um, the rational calculation. So we, the rule is we start from the most upstream um, location, which in this case happens to be down here. And so we have junction ID 11, and um, excuse me, pipe ID 11, pipe ID 12, and pipe ID 21. So pipe ID 11 connects junction 11 to 21. Pipe ID 12 connects junction 12 to 21. And pipe ID 21 connects junction 21 to 31. We won't really need those yet. Let's concentrate on the first one. 11 to 21. So what we need to do is figure out the flow that's going to go into that pipe which is the same as the flow that goes into the inlet at 1-1. The pipe happens to be 415 feet long. It's laid on a 2% slope. The drainage area that goes to that pipe is drainage area 1-1. It's 2.26 acres. It has a C, uh, runoff coefficient of 0.65, a cumulative area of 2.26 acres, so not very much interesting there because there's nothing upstream of it. And it has a CA value, which is the product of C in the area of 1.469. The summed up CA value is also 1.469. It has an inlet time of 11 minutes, an upstream sewer time of 0 minutes because there's no sewer upstream of it. So the time of concentration we want to use is 11 minutes. And we put the 11 minutes into our intensity equation for 4.33 inches per hour. Then we apply uh, the rational equation which is 4.33 inches per hour multiplied by the sum CA term for 6.35 cubic feet per second. Then we apply Manning's equation to solve for the required diameter 1.11 feet. Um, we're not going to buy a 1.11 foot pipe. We'll use a one and a quarter foot. So once we've selected a particular commercial size pipe, we compute a velocity in that pipe. We have a sewer time in minutes of 1.33 minutes. And that gets us this area and this pipe design. The next row is we deal with pipe ID 12, because it also connects to pipe 21. So 12 takes flow from area 12 and delivers it to 21. So 195 foot long pipe on a 4.4% 4 .4 slope. The drainage area that contributes to the pipe is area 12. Uh, it has 1.26 acres, 0.8 runoff coefficient, cumulative area 1.26. The CA value is 1.008. The sum CA is 1.008. <coughs> and the inlet time is 9.2 minutes. There is no upstream sewer. Um, and uh, it has a time of concentration 9.2 minutes for an intensity of 4.68 inches per hour, discharge of 4.72 cubic feet per second, computed diameter 1.34, recommended diameter 1.5, velocity uh, 2.67 feet per second for a travel time of 1.21 minutes. So we've handled that area, that area, and we've designed that pipe, 
in this pipe. Now we're coming to location 2-1, which has water coming to it from three ways. It has water coming in this pipe, it has water coming from this pipe, and then it has localized drainage directly to the area. So in that case, we're going to treat it um, in three different ways. Uh, first, we'll look at the local contribution and then the upstream contribution. So pipe number 2-1 connects junction 2-1 to 3-1. That particular pipe is 188 feet long. It's on slope 2.45% um, slope. The drainage area that comes to that is drainage area 2-1, but it also gets um, flow from drainage area 1-1 one, one, and also flow from drainage area 1-2. And we'll look at those other two to find the best time of concentration to use. So using the direct flow, it has a drainage area of uh, 3.89 acres. Make sure I got that right. Yeah, 3.89 acres. Uh, runoff coefficient of 0.7. Cumulative area at this point is 3.89. CA value is 2.7. Sum of CA is 2.7, inlet time of 13.7 minutes, and assuming no upstream sewer, we have an inlet time of 13 minutes. If we include pipe 1-1, it has an inlet time of 11 minutes plus a sewer time of 1.3 minutes for a total time of 12.3, and we include pipe 1-2, has its inlet time of 9.2 minutes, upstream time of 1.2 minutes for a total time of 10.2 minutes. We're going to use the local time in this case uh, for the pipe flow determination. So a total of 13.7 minutes. And so our pipe 2-1 to 3-1 is going to have a total drainage area coming to it of 7.41 acres. The sum of the CA is 5.2, so it's that number plus that number plus that number, so 5.2. And so 13.7 time of concentration produces a 3.89 inches per hour input multiplied by 5.2 for 20.24 cubic feet per second is going to leave junction 2-1 through pipe 2-1 uh, going to 3-1. Its diameter would be 1.66. We choose 1.75. We actually probably choose two, but 1.75. Velocity of eight feet per second for a sewer time of 0.37 minutes. And so at that point, we've just sized this pipe, this pipe, and that pipe, and we've accounted for all of this drainage area right here. If I had a drawing tool, I would draw on it. Um, I don't think I have a convenient drawing tool. This is Excel. It's not easy to draw on Excel. So then we move on to the next um, portion. So now we're at uh, drainage area 2-2, which happens to also drain to node 3-1, and it uh, it does that through pipe number 2-2, which is 213 feet long on a slope of just shy of 2%. Uh, drainage area 2-2 is 0.53 acres, runoff coefficient of 0.8, cumulative area 0.53, CA value 0.424, sum 0.424, inlet time of 5.2 minutes, and we'll use that 5.2 minutes to get an intensity, compute a discharge, compute a diameter, uh, select a commercially available diameter, calculate the velocity, calculate the sewer travel time. Then for pipe number 31, which connects node 31 to 41, we have the local contribution. Excuse me, that pipe is 166 feet long, 1% uh, slope, and it receives flow from uh, drainage area 3-1 as well as pipe 2-2 and pipe 2-1. Two, 
So the local flow is 0.68 acres at a 0.7 runoff coefficient for a sum CA of 0.476. Inlet time 8.7 minutes, no upstream sewer, 8.7 minutes. If we consider the contribution from drainage area 2.2, it has a sum CA value of 0.424, inlet time of 5 minutes, travel time of 1 minute, total time of 6 minutes, and lastly drainage area 2.1 has a CA value of uh, 5.2, inlet time of 13 minutes, travel time of 3 tenths of a minute, total time 14 minutes. We're going to use that 14 minutes as our time of concentration for computing the flow leaving um, node 3.1. So that's how we do this last um, row. So pipe 3.1 connects 3.1 to 4.1. It has a total drainage area of 8.62 acres draining to it. The total CA value is 6.1. It's the sum of the 5.2, the 424 and the 476, 61. We're going to use 14 minutes time of concentration. Gives us a rainfall intensity of 3.84 inches per hour times the 6.1 gives us a discharge of 23.42 cubic feet per second. Pipe diameter of 2 feet and some change, so we probably specify a 2 footer. Bear in mind we can do that because we always have a little bit of extra freeboard. Uh, velocity of 7.45 feet per second. We're starting to get a bit high on the velocity. Travel time of about 30, uh, half a minute. And that gets us our design for, so pipe 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 1 are sized. I'm indicating those with the yellow. And now we move further downstream towards our outlet. So now we want to size pipe 3.2, 3.3, and 4.1. So pipe 3.2, because it only receives local drainage from um, location 2.2, um, should be easy. It's 213 feet. Wait a minute. Let's go back here. 3.2 <clears throat> uh, has, has local contribution from drainage area 3.2. So it's 223 feet long, slope of point 1.75%, uh, 3.2 acres, 0.45 runoff coefficient, uh, 0.45 acres, 0.85 runoff coefficient for a CA value of 0.38, inlet time of 6 minutes, so we have 5.3 five three inches per hour, you get 2.11 CFS, size the pipe, and compute a sewer time in minutes, almost a minute of travel time in that pipe. We repeat for the next row, which takes care of pipe 3.3, three, which connects 3.3 three and 4.1, 138 feet, a CA value 1.027, 11 minutes, 4.19 inches per hour, uh, for a computed discharge of 4.3 CFS, we compute a diameter of 0.89, use a one footer, and we get a velocity of 5 feet a second for travel time of half a minute. And now the next pipe, we have to consider local plus the upstream contributions. So the local contribution is 2.01 acres, and it has a CA value of 1.5 and a inlet time of 9.5 minutes. The um, pipe 3.3 coming in uh, is draining a CA value of 0.38 and pipe excuse me, pipe 3.2 uh, coming in. Pipe 3.3 coming in is draining a CA value of 1.027 inlet time of 11 minutes and the local um, 
pipe 3-1 coming in is um, <clears throat> draining a 6.1 CA value for 14 minutes. So again, we'll choose the largest of the inlet plus travel times, which is 14 minutes. And so pipe 4-1, which connects from node 4-1 to 5-1, has a sum CA value of 9.017. It's taking contribution from a total of 12.66 acres with a 14.4 minute time of concentration for 3.79 inches per hour times 9.017 CA gives us 34.17 cubic feet per second. We need almost a three foot diameter pipe for that. We'll have a, a velocity of four feet per second and a travel time in that pipe of 0.66 minutes. And we move on accordingly. Um, so the, the design sequence goes from upstream to downstream and you're doing one group of connections at a time. And the the only confusing factor is the case where you have multiple sources of flow into a junction. And you're using it's confusing in the sense that you're using that information to determine which time of concentration to apply for calculating a rainfall intensity. And that rainfall intensity is then applied over all the contributing areas to that point. So I've got about five minutes left. I'm going to just skip down to the bottom because I think you can uh, figure that more or less on your own. When we get down to the bottom, we have a total of 19.61 acres and uh, 44 cubic feet per second. And by the time we're here, we're at a three and a half foot pipe. And we can summarize all that information. Uh, so these are the flows in the, in, the, in the individual pipes based on our design procedure. So pipe 116 uh, cubic feet per second. By the time we're at the bottom, we're at 44 cubic feet per second. And we can ask ourselves, does that, does that even make sense? Well, we have, um, we have 20 acres of drainage area, um, probably a uh, total travel time of 20 some odd minutes. So we could put uh, 20 minutes into the intensity equation, see what the intensity is. So a little bit over three inches per hour for 20 minutes. So we have three inches per hour applied to 20 acres, which would be uh, 60 cubic feet per second. But the runoff coefficient is not one. It's maybe um, maybe like 0.8. So 0.8 times 60 cubic feet per second is 48 cubic feet per second, which is pretty close to what we got uh, with this um, uh, method so that the, the numbers are reasonable. Uh, what we don't get by doing the whole thing is we have no in, we have no ability to distinguish behavior in individual pipes. So we have to follow this process to size each pipe. So to summarize what we've done, um, we've got the pipe IDs and these are the initial slopes we've provided. Those are based on topographic slopes. We have pipe diameters. Now for one critique this is actually a pretty bad design because only a fool would use this many different pipe diameters, especially over these links of just a few hundred feet. Um, it's cheaper for construction to minimize the number of different things that you have. So I mean, buying 100 uh, pieces of 1.25 pipe and then three pieces of 1.5 pipe is stupid. So more likely what we would do is Looks like our smallest diameter is 10. We'd probably scale that up to a 12. Our next size um, would be um, 24 two foot diameters, and then we would end up with four footers. So we'd only have three different pipe sizes, and, and we would have a slightly oversized system, but that would actually work in our uh, favor at some point. But let's pretend we're gonna do it by this procedure. So we have these different diameters. 
uh, expressed in feet, and here they are expressed in inches. So we'd have to find out if a 15-inch diameter pipe is commercially available. It is. A 18-inch is also available. 10 inches available. 21 inches is a weird size, but it could be had. 24 is common. 36 is common. 8 is common. 42 is a weird size, and 15 is a weird size. Then we have to uh, start to consider elevations. Um, so, so here's the elevations that, that we know. Um, we can uh, set the elevation of pipe 1.1 that the 1.1 uh, end of the pipe is at 735 feet, 727, 722, 721. And these elevations are set to ensure that we have enough physical cover above the pipe that we can drive over it. Um, so it, it takes more than three inches of soil to make it able to drive over a pipe. And, and that's as far as uh, this spreadsheet example is. And then we will um, revisit this example next time, add some more detail as we move it into a, a, a swim model. So that's there on the uh, server for examination. Let me see, did I make any changes? I actually don't want to save it. And that is the uh, rational method. Uh, if you've never ever done it, the first time out, it's a little tedious and confusing. Um, but after you do one or two of these, of this scale, I mean, complicated enough to be tedious, uh, it actually gets pretty straightforward. Uh, there is some design software uh, available to do this for you. I don't happen to have any uh, copies of it. Um, I usually uh, just proceed like this, or sometimes, because I'm familiar with SWIM, sometimes I'll go straight to the SWIM model and do my layouts there and um, make my uh, adjustments directly in SWIM. Uh, but at that point, I'm doing it kind of by uh, gut experience, and there's no actual procedure until I start running the hydraulics. Okay, so those are there available uh, for use. It looks like they work. The only um, caveat is the uh, annual maximum series one. I don't have it uh, plotting both uh, plots, so if you make changes, you won't see anything. And that um, pretty much is today's lesson. So, uh, Thank you very much. I will check the chat that I haven't been looking at. There it is. Okay, my cat's cute. That's all that's in the chat. And I will turn this back on. And I will... Um, actually, officially, I've gone two minutes over. So unless there's a burning question, I'm going to go ahead and terminate the call. Well, very good. Looks like everybody's happy to leave. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I will see you on Thursday and have a great afternoon. Goodbye.